Hey there, wisdom seekers. Welcome to the Brave New World Order podcast. Straight out the dungeons of podcasting. I am Brandon Snape One. Thank you so much for joining me today and as always along my journey dissecting this wild reality that we live in. This is the Kybalion chapters 9 through 15. If you haven't listened to the other chapters, you can. You definitely missed the step. So go back and start at the intro and chapters 1 through 8. Or if you're already familiar with this book and you just want to listen to this half, then I welcome you and thank you for joining me. So I'm not going to ramble on too much. I want you to be able to keep going and just keep listening and keep gaining wisdom that will hopefully help you and help you stay positive. I hope you really like this. And if you do, please leave a review. Please hit that like button. Please spread the wisdom and share this with anyone that you know, anybody random, help out the Brave New World Order podcast along the way, as well as spreading the ancient wisdom. And if you enjoy the Brave New World Order podcast, and you want to help see it grow, and you want to help support creative independent media, and independent creative minds like me, Brandon St. One, you can click the link in the show notes below and help support the Brave New World Order podcast. So without further ado, here is the Kybalion, chapters 9 through 15. The Kybalion, chapter 9, vibration. Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. The great third hermetic principle, the principle of vibration, embodies the truth. That motion is manifest in everything in the universe. That nothing is at rest. That everything moves, vibrates, and circles. This hermetic principle was recognized by some of the early Greek philosophers who embodied it in their systems. But then, for centuries, it was lost sight of by the thinkers outside of the hermetic ranks. But in the 19th century, physical science rediscovered the truth and the 20th century scientific discoveries have added additional proof of the correctness and truth of this centuries-old hermetic doctrine. The hermetic teachings are that not only is everything in constant movement and vibration, but the differences between the various manifestations of the universal power are due entirely to the varying rate and mode of vibrations. Not only this, but that even the all in itself manifests a constant vibration of such an infinite degree of intensity and rapid motion that it may be practically considered as at rest, the teachers directing the attention of the students to the fact that even on the physical plane, a rapidly moving object, such as a revolving wheel, seems to be at rest. The teachings are to the effect that spirit is at one end of the pole of vibration, the other pole being certain extremely gross forms of matter. Between these two poles are millions upon millions of different rates and modes of vibration. Modern science has proven that all that we call matter and energy are but modes of vibratory motion, and some of the more advanced scientists are rapidly moving toward the position of the occultists who hold that the phenomena of mind are likewise modes of vibration or motion. Let us see what science has to say regarding the question of vibrations in matter and energy. In the first place, science teaches that all matter manifests in some degree, the vibrations arising from temperature or heat, be an object cold or hot, both being but degrees of the same things, it manifests certain heat vibrations, and in that sense is in motion and vibration. Then all particles of matter are in circular movement, from corpuscle to suns, 
The planets revolve around suns, and many of them turn on their axes. The suns move around greater central points, and these are believed to move around still greater, and so on, ad infinitum. The molecules of which the particular kinds of matter are composed are in a state of constant vibration and movement around each other and against each other. The molecules are composed of atoms, which, likewise, are in a state of constant movement and vibration. The atoms are composed of corpuscles, sometimes called electrons, ions, etc., which also are in a state of rapid motion, revolving around each other, in which manifest a very rapid state and mode of vibration. And so we see that all forms of matter manifest vibration in accordance with the hermetic principle of vibration. And so it is with the various forms of energy science teaches that light, heat, magnetism, and electricity are but forms of vibratory motion connected in some way with and probably emanating from the ether. Science does not as yet attempt to explain the nature of the phenomena known as cohesion, which is the principle of molecular attraction, nor chemical affinity, which is the principle of atomic attraction, nor gravitation, the greatest mystery of the three, which is the principle of attraction by which every particle or mass of matter is bound to every other particle or mass. These three forms of energy are not as yet understood by science, yet the writers incline to the opinion that these two are manifestations of some form of vibratory energy, a fact which the Hermetists have held and taught for ages past. The universal ether which is postulated by science without its nature being understood clearly, is held by the Hermetists to be but a higher manifestation of that which is erroneously called matter. That is to say, matter at a higher degree of vibration, and is called by them the ethereal substance. The Hermetists teach that this ethereal substance is of extreme tenuity and elasticity, and pervades universal space, serving as a medium of transmission of waves of vibratory energy, such as heat, light, electricity, magnetism, etc. The teachings are that the ethereal substance is a connecting link between the forms of vibratory energy known as matter, on the one hand, and energy or force on the other, and also that it manifests a degree of vibration in rate and mode entirely in its own. Scientists have offered the illustration of a rapidly moving wheel, top or cylinder, to show the effects of increasing rates of vibration. The illustration supposes a wheel, top or revolving cylinder, running at a low rate of speed. We will call this revolving thing the object in following out the illustration. Let us suppose the object moving slowly. It may be seen readily, but no sound of its movement reaches the ear. The speed is gradually increased. In a few moments, its movement becomes so rapid that a deep growl or low note may be heard. Then, as the rate is increased, the note rises one in the musical scale. Then, the motion being still further increased, the next highest note is distinguished. Then, one after another, all the notes of the musical scale appear, rising higher and higher as the motion is increased. Finally, when the motions have reached a certain rate, the final note perceptible to human ears is reached, and the shrill, piercing shriek dies away, and silence follows. No sound is heard from the revolving object the rate of motion being so high that the human ear cannot register the vibrations. Then comes a perception of rising degrees of heat. Then, after quite a time, the eye catches a glimpse of the object becoming a dull, dark, reddish color. As the rate increases, the red becomes brighter. Then, as the speed increases, 
The red melts into an orange. Then the orange melts into a yellow. Then follow successively the shades of green, blue, indigo, and finally violet as the rate of speed increases. Then the violet shades away and all color disappears, the human eye not being able to register them, but there are invisible rays emanating from the revolving object, the rays that are used in photographing and other subtle rays of light, then begin to manifest the peculiar rays known as the X-rays, etc., as the constitution of the object changes. Electricity and magnetism are emitted when the appropriate rate of vibration is attained. When the object reaches a certain rate of vibration, its molecules disintegrate and resolve themselves into the original elements or atoms. Then the atoms, following the principle of vibration, are separated into the countless corpuscles of which they are composed. And finally, even the corpuscles disappear and the object may be said to be composed of the ethereal substance. Science does not dare follow the illustration further, but the hermetists teach that if the vibrations be continually increased, the object would mount up the successive states of manifestation and would in turn manifest the various mental stages, and then on spiritward, until it would finally re-enter the all, which is absolute spirit. The object, however, would have ceased to be an object long before the stage of ethereal substance was reached, but otherwise, the illustration is correct in as much as it shows the effect of constantly increased rates and modes of vibration. It must be remembered in the above illustration that at the stages at which the object throws off vibrations of light, heat, etc., it is not actually resolved into those forms of energy which are much higher in the scale, but simply that it reaches a degree of vibration in which those forms of energy are liberated in a degree from the confining influences of its molecules, atoms, and corpuscles. As the case may be, these forms of energy, although much higher in the scale than matter, are imprisoned and confined in the material combinations by reason of the energies manifesting through and using material forms, but thus becoming entangled and confined in their creations of material forms, which, to an extent, is true of all creations. The creating force becoming involved in its creation. But the hermetic teachings go much further than those do of modern science. They teach that all manifestation of thought, emotion, reason, will, or desire, or any mental state or condition, are accompanied by vibrations, a portion of which are thrown off and which tend to affect the minds of other persons by induction. This is the principle which produces the phenomena of telepathy, mental influence, and other forms of the action and power of mind over mind with which the general public is rapidly becoming acquainted, owing to the wide dissemination of occult knowledge by the various schools cults, and teachers along these lines at this time. Every thought, emotion, or mental state has its corresponding rate and mode of vibration, and by an effort of the will of the person or of the other person, these mental states may be reproduced, just as a musical tone may be reproduced by causing an instrument to vibrate at a certain rate, just as color may be reproduced in the same way by a knowledge of the principle of vibration as applied to mental phenomena, one may polarize his mind at any degree he wishes, thus gaining a perfect control over his mental states, moods, etc. In the same way, he may affect the minds of others, producing the desired mental states in them. In short, he may be able to produce on the mental plane that which science produces on the physical plane, namely, vibrations at will. This power, of course, 
may be acquired only by the proper instruction, exercises, practice, etc., the science being that of mental transmutation, one of the branches of the hermetic art. A little reflection on what we have said will show the student that the principle of vibration underlies the wonderful phenomena of the power manifested by the masters and adepts who are able to apparently set aside the laws of nature, but who, in reality, are simply using one law against another, one principle against others, and one who accomplish their results by changing the vibrations of material objects or forms of energy, and thus perform what are commonly called miracles. As one of the old hermetic writers has truly said, he who understands the principle of vibration has grasped the scepter of power. The Kybalion, Chapter 10, Polarity. Everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. The great fourth hermetic principle, the principle of polarity, embodies the truth that all manifested things have two sides, two aspects, two poles, a pair of opposites, with manifold degrees between the two extremes. The old paradoxes which have ever perplexed the mind of men are explained by an understanding of this principle. Man has always recognized something akin to this principle and has endeavored to express it by such sayings, maxims, and aphorisms as the following. Everything is and isn't at the same time. All truths are but half-truths. Every truth is half-false. There are two sides to everything. There is a reverse side to every shield, etc., etc. The hermetic teachings are to the effect that the difference between things seemingly diametrically opposed to each other is merely a matter of degree. It teaches that the pairs of opposites may be reconciled and that thesis and antithesis are identical in nature but different in degree and that the universal reconciliation of opposites is affected by a recognition of this principle of polarity. The teachers claim that illustrations of this principle may be had on every hand, and from an examination into the real nature of anything, they begin by showing that spirit and matter are but the two poles of the same thing, the intermediate planes being merely degrees of vibration. They show that the all and the many are the same, the difference being merely a matter of degree of mental manifestation. Thus, the law and laws are the two opposite poles of one thing. Likewise, principle and principles, infinite mind and finite minds. Then, passing on to the physical plane, they illustrate the principle by showing that heat and cold are identical in nature, the differences being merely a matter of degrees. The thermometer shows many degrees of temperature, the lowest pole being called cold and the highest heat. Between these two poles are many degrees of heat or cold. Call them either and you are equally correct. The higher of two degrees is always warmer, while the lower is always colder. There is no absolute standard. All is a matter of degree. There is no place on the thermometer where heat ceases and cold begins, it is all a matter of higher or lower vibrations. The very terms high and low, which we are compelled to use, are but poles of the same thing. The terms are relative. So, with east and west, travel around the world in an eastward direction, and you reach a point which is called west at your starting point, and you return from that westward point. Travel far enough north, 
and you will find yourself traveling south or vice versa. Light and darkness are poles of the same thing with many degrees between them. The musical scale is the same. Starting with C, you move upward until you reach another C and so on. The differences between the two ends of the board being the same with many degrees between the two extremes. The scale of color is the same, higher and lower vibrations being the only difference between high violet and low red. Large and small are relative. So are noise and quiet. Hard and soft follow the rule. Likewise, sharp and dull, positive and negative are the two poles of the same thing with countless degrees between them. Good and bad are not absolute. We call one end of the scale good and the other bad, or one end good and the other evil, according to the use of the terms. A thing is less good than the thing higher in the scale, but that less good thing, in turn, is more good than the next thing below it, and so on. The more or less being regulated by the position on the scale. And so it is on the mental plane. Love and hate are generally regarded as being things diametrically opposed to each other, entirely different, unreconcilable. But we apply the principle of polarity. We find that there is no such thing as absolute love or absolute hate as distinguished from each other. The two are merely terms applied to the two poles of the same thing. Beginning at any point of the scale, we find more love or less hate as we ascend the scale and more hate or less love as we descend. This being true no matter from what point, high or low we may start. There are degrees of love and hate and there is a middle point where like and dislike become so faint that it is difficult to distinguish between them. Courage and fear come under the same rule. The pairs of opposites exist everywhere. Where you find one thing, you find its opposite, the two poles. And it is this fact that enables the Hermetist to transmute one mental state into another along the lines of polarization. Things belonging to different classes cannot be transmuted into each other, but things of the same class may be changed, that is, may have their polarity changed. Thus, love never becomes east or west or red or violet, but it may and often does turn into hate, and likewise, hate may be transformed into love by changing its polarity. Courage may be transmuted into fear and the reverse. Hard things may be rendered soft, dull things become sharp, hot things become cold, and so on. The transmutation always being between things of the same kind of different degrees. Take the case of a fearful man. By raising his mental vibrations along the line of fear courage, he can be filled with the highest degree of courage and fearlessness. And likewise, the slothful man may change himself into an active, energetic individual simply by polarizing along the lines of the desired quality. The student who is familiar with the processes by which the various schools of mental science, etc. produce changes in the mental states of those following their teachings may not readily understand the principle underlying many of these changes. When, however, the principle of polarity is once grasped and it is seen that the mental changes are occasioned by a change of polarity, a sliding along the same scale, the matter is more readily understood. The change is not in the nature of a transmutation of one thing into another thing entirely different, but is merely a change of degree in the same things, a vastly important difference. For instance, Borrowing an analogy from the physical plane, it is impossible to change heat into sharpness, loudness, highness, etc., but heat may readily be transmuted into cold simply by lowering the vibrations. 
In the same way, hate and love are mutually transmutable, so are fear and courage. But fear cannot be transformed into love, nor can courage be transmuted into hate. The mental states belong to the innumerable classes, each class of which has its opposite poles, along which each transmutation is possible. The student will readily recognize that in the mental states, as well as in the phenomena of the physical plane, the two poles may be classified as positive and negative, respectfully. Thus, love is positive to hate, courage to fear, activity to non-activity, etc., etc. And it will also be noticed that even to those unfamiliar with the principle of vibration, the positive pole seems to be of a higher degree than the negative, and readily dominates it. The tendency of nature is in the direction of the dominant activity of the positive pole. In addition to the changing of the poles of one's own mental states by the operation of the art of polarization, the phenomena of mental influence in its manifold phases shows us that the principle may be extended so as to embrace the phenomena of the influence of one mind over that of another, of which so much has been written and taught of late years. When it is understood that mental induction is possible, that is that mental states may be produced by induction from others, then we can readily see how a certain rate of vibration or polarization of a certain mental state may be communicated to another person and his polarity in that class of mental states thus changed. It is along this principle that the results of many of the mental treatments are obtained. For instance, a person is blue, melancholy, and full of fear. A mental scientist bringing his own mind up to the desired vibration by his trained will and thus obtaining the desired polarization in his own case, then produces a similar mental state in the other by induction, the result being that the vibrations are raised and the person polarizes toward the positive end of the scale instead toward the negative, and his fear and other negative emotions are transmuted to courage and similar positive mental states. A little study will show you that these mental changes are nearly all along the line of polarization, the change being one of degree rather than of kind. A knowledge of the existence of this great hermetic principle will enable the student to better understand his own mental states and those of other people. He will see that these states are all matters of degree, and seeing thus, he will be able to raise or lower the vibration at will to change his mental poles and thus be master of his mental states instead of being their servant and slave. And by his knowledge, he will be able to aid his fellows intelligently and by the appropriate methods change the polarity when the same is desirable. We advise all students to familiarize themselves with this principle of polarity for a correct understanding of the same will throw light on many difficult subjects. The Kybalion Chapter 11 Rhythm Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. The great fifth hermetic principle, the principle of rhythm, embodies the truth that in everything there is manifested a measured motion, a to and from movement, a flow and inflow, a swing forward and backward, a pendulum-like movement, a tide-like ebb and flow, a high tide and a low tide. Between the two poles manifest on the physical, mental, or spiritual planes. The principle of rhythm is closely connected with the principle of polarity described in the preceding chapter. Rhythm manifests between the two poles established by the principle of polarity. This does not mean, however, 
that the pendulum of rhythm swings to the extreme poles, for this rarely happens. In fact, it is difficult to establish the extreme polar opposites in the majority of cases, but the swing is ever toward first one pole and then the other. There is always an action and reaction, an advance and a retreat, a rising and a sinking, manifested in all of the airs and phenomena of the universe, suns, worlds, men, animals, plants, minerals, forces, energy, mind and matter, yes, even spirit, manifests this principle. The principle manifests in the creation and destruction of worlds, in the rise and fall of nations, in the life history of all things, and finally, in the mental states of man, beginning with the manifestations of spirit, of the all, it will be noticed that there is ever the outpouring and the indrawing, the outbreathing and inbreathing of Brahm, as the Brahmins word it. Universes are created, reach their extreme low point of materiality, and then begin their upward swing. Suns spring into being, and then their height of power being reached the process of retrogression begins, and after eons, they become dead masses of matter, awaiting another impulse, which starts again their inner energies into activity, and a new solar life cycle is begun, and thus it is with all the worlds they are born, grow, and die, only to be reborn, and thus it is with all the things of shape and form they swing from action to reaction, from birth to death, from activity to inactivity, and then back again. Thus, it is with all living things. They are born, grow, and die, and then are reborn. So it is with all great movements, philosophies, creeds, fashions, governments, nations, and all else. Birth, growth, maturity, decadence, death, and then new birth. The swing of the pendulum is ever in evidence. Night follows day and day night. The pendulum swings from summer to winter and then back again. The corpuscles, atoms, molecules, and all masses of matter swing around the circle of their nature. There is no such thing as absolute rest or cessation from movement and all movement partakes of rhythm. The principle is of universal application. It may be applied to any question or phenomena of any of the many planes of life. It may be applied to all phases of human activity. There is always the rhythmic swing from one pole to the other. The universal pendulum is ever in motion. The tides of life flow in and out according to law. The principle of rhythm is well understood by modern science and is considered a universal law as applied to material things. But the Hermetists carry the principle much further and know that its manifestations and influence extend to the mental activities of man and that it accounts for the bewildering succession of moods, feelings, and other annoying and perplexing changes that we notice in ourselves. But the Hermetists, by studying the operations of this principle, have learned to escape some of its activities by transmutation. The Hermetic Masters long since discovered that while the principle of rhythm was invariable and ever in evidence in mental phenomena, still there were two planes of its manifestation so far as mental phenomena are concerned. They discovered that there were two general planes of consciousness, the lower and the higher, the understanding of which fact enabled them to rise to the higher plane and thus escape the swing of the rhythmic pendulum which manifested on the lower plane. In other words, the swing of the pendulum occurred on the unconscious plane and the consciousness was not affected. This they call the law of neutralization. Its operations consist 
in the raising of the ego above the vibrations of the unconscious plane of mental activity so that the negative swing of the pendulum is not manifested in consciousness and therefore they are not affected. It is akin to rising above a thing and letting it pass beneath you. The hermetic master or advanced student polarizes himself at the desired pole and by a process akin to refusing to participate in the backward swing, or if you prefer a denial of its influence over him, he stands firm in his polarized position and allows the mental pendulum to swing back along the unconscious plane. All individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery accomplish this more or less unknowingly, and by refusing to allow their moods and negative mental states to affect them, they apply the law of neutralization. The master, however, carries this to a much higher degree of proficiency, and by the use of his will, he attains a degree of poise and mental firmness, almost impossible of belief on the part of those who allow themselves to be swung backward and forward by the mental pendulum of moods and feelings. The importance of this will be appreciated by any thinking person who realizes what creatures of moods, feelings, and emotion the majority of people are, and how little mastery of themselves they manifest. If you will stop and consider a moment, you will realize how much these swings of rhythm have affected you in your life, how a period of enthusiasm has been invariably followed by an opposite feeling and mood of depression. Likewise, your moods and periods of courage have been succeeded by an equal mood of fear, and so it has ever been with the majority of persons. Tides of feeling have ever risen and have ever fallen with them, but they have never suspected the cause or reason of this mental phenomena. An understanding of the workings of this principle will give one the key to the mastery of these rhythmic swings of feeling and will enable him to know himself better and to avoid being carried away by these inflows and outflows. The will is superior to the conscious manifestation of this principle, although the principle itself can never be destroyed. We may escape its effects, but the principle operates nevertheless. The pendulum ever swings, although we may escape being carried along with it. There are other features of the operation of this principle of rhythm of which we wish to speak at this point. There comes into its operations that which is known as the law of compensation. One of the definitions or meanings of the word compensate is to counterbalance, which is the sense in which the hermetists use the term. It is the law of compensation to which the Kybalion refers when it says, the measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. The law of compensation is that the swing in one direction determines the swing in the opposite direction or to the opposite pole. The one balances or counterbalances the other. On the physical plane, we see many examples of this law. The pendulum of the clock swings a certain distance to the right and then an equal distance to the left. The seasons balance each other in the same way. The tides follow the same law, and the same law is manifested in all phenomena of rhythm. The pendulum, with a short swing in one direction, has but a short swing in the other, while the long swing to the right invariably means the long swing to the left. An object hurled upward to a certain height has an equal distance to traverse on its return. The force with which a projectile is sent upward a mile is reproduced when the projectile returns to the earth on its return journey. This law is constant on the physical plane, as reference to the standard authorities will show you. But the hermetists carry it still further. They teach that a man's mental states are subject to the same law. The man who enjoys keenly is subject to keen suffering while he who feels but little pain is capable of feeling but little joy. The pig suffers but little mentally and enjoys but little. He is compensated. And, on the other hand, there are other animals who enjoy keenly 
but whose nervous organism and temperament caused them to suffer exquisite degrees of pain. And so it is with man. There are temperaments which permit of but low degrees of enjoyment and equally low degrees of suffering, while there are others which permit the most intense enjoyment, but also the most intense suffering. The rule is that the capacity for pain and pleasure in each individual are balanced. The law of compensation is in full operation here. But the hermetists still go further in this matter. They teach that before one is able to enjoy a certain degree of pleasure, he must have swung as far proportionately toward the other pole of feeling. They hold, however, that the negative is precedent to the positive in this matter, that it is to say that in experiencing a certain degree of pleasure, it does not follow that he will have to pay up for it with a corresponding degree of pain. On the contrary, the pleasure is the rhythmic swing according to the law of compensation for a degree of pain previously experienced either in the present life or in a previous incarnation. This throws a new light on the problem of pain. The hermetists regard the chain of lives as continuous and as forming a part of one life of the individual so that in consequence the rhythmic swing is understood in this way while it would be without meaning unless the truth of reincarnation is admitted. But the hermetists claim that the master or advanced student is able to a great degree to escape the swing toward pain by the process of neutralization before mentioned. By rising on to the higher plane of the ego, much of the experience that comes to those dwelling on the lower plane is avoided and escaped. The law of compensation plays an important part in the lives of men and women. It will be noticed that one generally pays the price of anything he possesses or lacks. If he has one thing, he lacks another, the balance is struck. No one can keep his penny and have the bit of cake at the same time. Everything has its pleasant and unpleasant sides. The things that one gains are always paid for by the things that one loses. The rich possesses much that the poor lack, while the poor often possess things that are beyond the reach of the rich. The millionaire may have the inclination toward feasting and the wealth wherewith to secure all the dainties and luxuries of the table while he lacks the appetite to enjoy the same. He envies the appetite and digestion of the laborer who lacks the wealth and inclinations of the millionaire and who gets more pleasure from his plain food than the millionaire could obtain even if his appetite were not jaded nor his digestion ruined for the wants, habits, and inclinations differ. And so it is through life. The law of compensation is ever in operation, striving to balance and counterbalance, and always succeeding in time. Even though several lives may be required for the return swing of the pendulum rhythm. The Kybalion Chapter 12 Causation Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. The great sixth hermetic principle, the principle of cause and effect, embodies the truth that law pervades the universe, that nothing happens by chance. That chance is merely a term indicating cause existing but not recognized or perceived. That phenomena is continuous without break or exception. The principle of cause and effect underlies all scientific thought, ancient and modern. And it was enunciated by the hermetic teachers in the earliest days. While many and varied disputes between the many schools of thought have since arisen. These disputes have been principally upon the details of the operations of the principle, and still more often upon the meaning of certain words. The underlying principle of cause and effect has been accepted as correct by practically all the thinkers of the world worthy of the name. To think otherwise 
would be to take the phenomena of the universe from the domain of law and order and to relegate it to the control of the imaginary something which men have called chance. A little consideration will show anyone that there is in reality no such thing as pure chance. Webster defines the word chance as follows. A supposed agent or mode of activity other than a force, law, or purpose. The operation or activity of such agent. The supposed effect of such an agent. A happening. Fortuity. Casualty. Etc. But a little consideration will show you that there can be no such agent as chance. In the sense of something outside of law. Something outside of cause and effect. How could there be a something acting in the phenomenal universe independent of the laws, order, and continuity of the latter? Such a something would be entirely independent of the orderly trend of the universe and therefore superior to it. We can imagine nothing outside of the all being outside of the law and that only because the all is the law in itself. There is no room in the universe for a something outside of and independent of law. The existence of such a something would render all natural laws ineffective and would plunge the universe into chaotic disorder and lawlessness. A careful examination will show that what we call chance is merely an expression relating to obscure causes, causes that we cannot perceive, causes that we cannot understand. The word chance is derived from a word meaning to fall, as the falling of dice. The idea being that the fall of the dice and many other happenings are merely a happening, unrelated to any cause. And this is the sense in which the term is generally employed. But when the matter is closely examined, it is seen that there is no chance whatsoever about the fall of the dice. Each time a die falls and displays a certain number, it obeys a law as infallible as that which governs the revolution of the planets around the sun. Back of the fall of the die are causes, or chains of causes, running back further than the mind can follow. The position of the die in the box, the amount of muscular energy expended in the throw, the condition of the table, etc., etc., are all causes the effect of which may be seen. But back of these seen causes, there are chains of unseen preceding causes, all of which had a bearing upon the number of the die which fell uppermost. If a die be cast a great number of times, it will be found that the numbers shown will be about equal. That is, there will be an equal number of one spot, two spot, etc. coming uppermost. Toss a penny in the air, and it may come down either heads or tails, but make a sufficient number of tosses, and the heads and tails will be about even. This is the operation of the law of average, but both the average and the single toss come under the law of cause and effect, and if we were able to examine into the preceding causes, it would be clearly seen that it was simply impossible for the die to fall other than it did under the same circumstances and at the same time. Given the same causes, the same results will follow. There is always a cause and a because to every event. Nothing happens without a cause, or rather, a chain of causes. Some confusion has arisen in the minds of persons considering this principle from the fact that they were unable to explain how one thing could cause another thing, that is, be the creator of the second thing. As a matter of fact, no thing ever causes or creates another thing. Cause and effect deals merely with the events. An event is that which comes, arrives, or happens as a result or consequent of some preceding event. No event creates another event, but is merely a preceding link in the great orderly chain of events flowing from the creative energy of the all. There is a continuity between all events precedent, consequent, 
and subsequent. There is a relation existing between everything that has gone before and everything that follows. A stone is dislodged from a mountainside and crashes through a roof of a cottage in the valley below. At first sight, we regard this as a chance effect, but when we examine the matter, we find a great chain of causes behind it. In the first place, there was the rain which softened the earth supporting the stone and which allowed it to fall. Then back of that was the influence of the sun, other rains, etc., which gradually disintegrated the piece of rock from a larger piece. Then there were the causes which led to the formation of the mountain and its upheaval by convulsions of nature, and so on ad infinitum. Then we might follow up the causes behind the rain, etc. Then we might consider the existence of the roof. In short, we would soon find ourselves involved in a mesh of causes and effect, from which we would soon strive to extricate ourselves. Just as a man has two parents, and four grandparents, and eight great-grandparents, and sixteen great-great-grandparents, and so on, until when, say, Forty generations are calculated, the numbers of ancestors run into many millions. So it is with the number of causes behind even the most trifling effect or phenomena, such as the passage of a tiny speck of soot before your eye. It is not an easy matter to trace the bit of soot back to the early period of the world's history when it formed a part of a massive tree trunk which it was afterward converted into coal, and so on, until as the speck of soot it now passes before your vision on its way to other adventures, and a mighty chain of events, causes, and effects brought it to its present condition, and the latter is but one of the chain of events which will go to produce other events hundreds of years from now, one of the series of events arising from the tiny bit of soot was the writing of these lines, which caused the typesetter to perform certain work, the proofreader to do likewise, and which will arouse certain thoughts in your mind and that of others, which, in turn, will affect others, and so on, and on, and on, beyond the ability of man to think further, and all from the passage of a tiny bit of soot, all of which shows the relativity and association of things and the further fact that there is no great, there is no small in the mind that causeth all. Stop to think a moment. If a certain man had not met a certain maid, away back in the dim period of the Stone Age, you are now reading these lines would not now be here. And if, perhaps, the same couple had failed to meet, we who now write these lines would not now be here, and the very act of writing on our part and the act of reading on yours will affect not only the respective lives of yourself and ourselves, but will also have a direct or indirect effect upon many other people now living and who will live in the ages to come. Every thought we think, every act we perform has its direct and indirect results which fit into the great chain of cause and effect. We do not wish to enter into a consideration of free will or determinism in this work for various reasons. Among the many reasons is the principle one that neither side of the controversy is entirely right. In fact, both sides are partially right. According to the Hermetic teachings, the principle of polarity shows that both are but half-truths. The opposing poles of truth, the teachings, are that a man may be both free and yet bound by necessity, depending upon the meaning of the terms and the height of truth from which the matter is examined. The ancient writers express the matter thus, the further the creation is from the center, the more it is bound, the nearer the center it reaches, the nearer free it is. The majority of people are more or less the slaves of heredity, environment, etc., and manifest very little freedom. They are swayed by the opinions, customs, and thoughts of the outside world, and also by their emotions, feelings, moods, etc. 
they manifest no mastery worthy of the name. They indignantly repudiate this assertion, saying, Why, I certainly am free to act and do as I please. I do just what I want to do, but they fail to explain whence arise the want to, and as I please, what makes them want to do one thing in preference to another, what makes them pleased to do this and not to do that. Is there no because to their pleasing and wanting? The master can change these pleases and wants into others at the opposite end of the mental pole. He is able to will to will instead of to will because some feeling, mood, emotion, or environmental suggestion arouses a tendency or desire within him so to do. The majority of people are carried along like the falling stone, obedient to environment, outside influences, and internal moods, desires, etc. Not to speak of the desires and wills of others stronger than themselves, heredity, environment, and suggestion, carrying them along without resistance on their part, or the exercise of the will. Moved like the pawns on the checkerboard of life, they play their parts and are laid aside after the game is over, but the masters, knowing the rules of the game, rise above the plane of material life and placing themselves in touch with the higher powers of their nature, dominate their own moods, characters, qualities, and polarity, as well as the environment surrounding them, and thus become movers in the game, instead of pawns, causes instead of effects. The masters do not escape the causation of the higher planes, but fall in with the higher laws, and thus master circumstances on the lower plane. They thus form a conscious part of the law, instead of being mere blind instruments. While they serve on the higher planes, they rule on the material plane. But on higher and on lower, the law is always in operation. There is no such things as chance. The blind goddess has been abolished by reason. We are able to see now, with eyes made clear by knowledge, that everything is governed by universal law, that the infinite number of laws are but manifestations of the one great law, the law which is the all. It is true, indeed, that not a sparrow drops unnoticed by the mind of the all, that even the hairs on our head are numbered, as the scriptures have said. There is nothing outside of law, nothing that happens contrary to it, and yet do not make the mistake of supposing that man is but a blind automaton. Far from that, the hermetic teachings are that man may use law to overcome laws and that the higher will always prevail against the lower until at last he has reached the stage in which he seeks refuge in the law itself and laughs the phenomenal laws to scorn. Are you able to grasp the inner meaning of this? The Kybalion Chapter 13 Gender Gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes. The great seventh hermetic principle, the principle of gender, embodies the truth that there is gender manifested in everything, that the masculine and feminine principles are ever present and active in all phases of phenomena on each and every plane of life. At this point, we think it well to call your attention to the fact that gender, in its hermetic sense, and sex in the ordinarily accepted use of the term, are not the same. The word gender is derived from the Latin root meaning to beget, to procreate, to generate, to create, to produce. A moment's consideration will show you that the word has a much broader and more general meaning than the term sex the latter referring to the physical distinctions between male and female living things. Sex is merely a manifestation of gender on a certain plane of the great physical plane, the plane of organic life. We wish to impress this distinction upon your minds for the reason 
that certain writers who have acquired a smattering of the hermetic philosophy have sought to identify this seventh hermetic principle with wild and fanciful and often reprehensible theories and teachings regarding sex. The office of gender is solely that of creating, producing, generating, etc. And its manifestations are visible on every plane of phenomena. It is somewhat difficult to produce proofs of this along scientific lines for the reason that science has not as of yet recognized this principle as of universal application. But still, some proofs are forthcoming from scientific sources. In the first place, we find a distinct manifestation of the principle of gender among the corpuscles, the ions, or electrons which constitute the basis of matter as science now knows the latter, and which, by forming certain combinations, form the atom, which until lately was regarded as final and indivisible. The latest word of science is that the atom is composed of a multitude of corpuscles, electrons, and ions, the various names being applied by different authorities, revolving around each other and vibrating at a high degree and intensity. But the accompanying statement is made that the formation of the atom is really due to the clustering of negative corpuscles around a positive one. The positive corpuscles seeming to exert a certain influence upon the negative corpuscles, causing the latter to assume certain combinations and thus create or generate an atom. This is in line with the most ancient hermetic teachings, which have always identified the masculine principle of gender with the positive and the feminine with the negative poles of electricity. Now, a word at this point regarding this identification. The public mind has formed an entirely erroneous impression regarding the qualities of the so-called negative pole of electrified or magnetized matter. The terms positive and negative are very wrongly applied to this phenomenon by science. The word positive means something real and strong as compared with a negative unreality or weakness. Nothing is further from the real facts of electrical phenomena. The so-called negative pole of the battery is really the pole in and by which the generation or production of new forms and energies is manifested. There is nothing negative about it. The best scientific authorities now use the word cathode in place of negative. The word cathode comes from the Greek root meaning descent, the path of generation, etc. From the cathode pole emerged a swarm of electrons or corpuscles. From the same pole emerged those wonderful rays which have revolutionized scientific conceptions during the past decade. The cathode pole is the mother of all of the strange phenomena which have rendered useless the old textbooks and which have caused many long accepted theories to be relegated to the scrap pile of scientific speculation. The cathode or negative pole is the mother principle of electrical phenomena and of the finest forms of matter as yet known to science. So you see, we are justified in refusing to use the term negative in our consideration of the subject and in insisting upon substituting the word feminine for the old term. The facts of the case bear us out in this without taking the hermetic teachings into consideration. And so we shall use the word feminine in the place of negative in speaking of that pole of activity. The latest scientific teachings are that the creative corpuscles or electrons are feminine. Science says they are composed of negative electricity. We say they are composed of feminine energy. A feminine corpuscle becomes detached from, or rather leaves, a masculine corpuscle and starts on a new career. It actively seeks a union with a masculine corpuscle, being urged thereto by the natural impulse to create new forms of matter or energy. One writer goes so far as to use the term, it at once seeks of its own volition, a union, etc. This detachment and uniting form the base of the greater part of the activities of the chemical world. When the feminine corpuscle unites with a masculine corpuscle, a certain process is begun. 
the feminine particles vibrate rapidly under the influence of the masculine energy and circle rapidly around the latter. The result is the birth of a new atom. This new atom is really composed of a union of the masculine and feminine electrons or corpuscles. But when the union is formed, the atom is a separate thing, having certain properties, but no longer manifesting the property of free electricity. The process of detachment or separation of the feminine electrons is called ionization. These electrons or corpuscles are the most active workers in nature's field arising from their unions or combinations manifest the varied phenomena of light, heat, electricity, magnetism, attraction, repulsion, chemical affinity, and the reverse, and similar phenomena. And all this arises from the operation of the principle of gender on the plane of energy. The part of the masculine principle seems to be that of directing a certain inherent energy toward the feminine principle and thus starting into activity the creative processes. But the feminine principle is always the one doing the active creative work, and this is so on all planes. And yet, each principle is incapable of operative energy without the assistance of the other. In some of the forms of life, the two principles are combined in one organism. For that matter, everything in the organic world manifests both genders. There is always the masculine present in the feminine form and the feminine form. The hermetic teachings include much regarding the operation of the two principles of gender in the production and manifestation of various forms of energy, etc. But we do not deem it expedient to go on into detail regarding the same at this point because we are unable to back up the same with scientific proof for the reason that science has not as yet progressed thus far but the example we have given you of the phenomena of the electrons or corpuscles will show you that science is on the right path and will also give you a general idea of the underlying principles. Some leading scientific investigators have announced their belief that in the formation of crystals there was to be found something that corresponded to sex activity, which is another straw showing the direction the scientific winds are blowing, and each year will bring other facts to corroborate the correctness of the hermetic principle of gender. It will be found that gender is in constant operation and manifestation in the field of inorganic matter and in the field of energy or force. Electricity is now generally regarded as the something into which all other forms of energy seem to melt or dissolve. The electrical theory of the universe is the latest scientific doctrine and is growing rapidly in popularity and general acceptance, and it thus follows that if we are able to discover in the phenomena of electricity, even at the very root and source of its manifestations, a clear and unmistakable evidence of the presence of gender and its activities, we are justified in asking you to believe that science at last has offered proofs of the existence in all universal phenomena of that great hermetic principle, the principle of gender. It is not necessary to take up your time with the well-known phenomena of the attraction and repulsion of the atoms, chemical affinity, the loves and hates of the atomic particles, the attraction or cohesion between the molecules of matter. These facts are too well known to need extended comment from us. But have you ever considered that all of these things are manifestations of the gender principle. Can you not see that the phenomena is on all fours with that of the corpuscle or electrons? And more than this, can you not see the reasonableness of the hermetic teachings which assert the very law of gravitation, that strange attraction by reason of which all particles and bodies of matter in the universe tend toward each other, is but another manifestation of the principle of gender, which operates in the direction of attracting the masculine to the feminine energies 
and vice versa. We cannot offer you scientific proof of this at this time, but examine the phenomena in the light of the hermetic teachings on the subject and see if you have not a better working hypothesis than any offered by physical science. Submit all physical phenomena to the test and you will discern the principle of gender ever in evidence. Let us now pass on to a consideration of the operation of the principle on the mental plane. Many interesting features are there awaiting examination. The Kybalion, Chapter 14, Mental Gender. Students of psychology who have followed the modern trend of thought along the lines of mental phenomena are struck by the persistence of the dual mind idea which has manifested itself so strongly during the past 10 or 15 years and which has given rise to a number of plausible theories regarding the nature and constitution of these two minds. The late Thompson J. Hudson attained great popularity in 1893 by advancing his well-known theory of the objective and subjective minds which he held existed in every individual. Other writers have attracted almost equal attention by the theories regarding the conscious and subconscious minds, the voluntary and involuntary minds, the active and passive minds, etc., etc. The theories of the various writers differ from each other, but there remains the underlying principle of the duality of mind. The student of the hermetic philosophy is tempted to smile when he reads and hears these many new theories regarding the duality of mind, each school adhering tenaciously to its own pet theories and each claiming to have discovered the truth. The student turns back the pages of occult history and away back in the dim beginnings of occult teachings he finds references to the ancient hermetic doctrine of the principle of gender on the mental plane the manifestation of mental gender. And examining further, he finds that the ancient philosophy took cognizance of the phenomenon of the dual mind and accounted for it by the theory of mental gender. This idea of mental gender may be explained in a few words to students who are familiar with the modern theories just alluded to. The masculine principle of mind corresponds to the so-called objective mind, conscious mind, voluntary mind, active mind, etc. And the feminine principle of mind corresponds to the so-called subjective mind, subconscious mind, involuntary mind, passive mind, etc. Of course, the hermetic teachings do not agree with the many modern theories regarding the nature of the two phases of mind, nor does it admit Many of the facts claimed for the two respective aspects have some of the said theories and claims being very far-fetched and incapable of standing the test of experiment and demonstration. We point to the phases of agreement merely for the purpose of helping the student to assimilate his previously acquired knowledge with the teachings of the hermetic philosophy. Students of Hudson will notice the statement at the beginning of his second chapter of the Law of Psychic Phenomena that the mystic jargon of the hermetic philosophers discloses the same general idea, i.e. the duality of mind. If Dr. Hudson had taken the time and trouble to decipher a little of the mystic jargon of the hermetic philosophy, he might have received much light upon the subject of the dual mind, but then, perhaps, his most interesting work might not have been written. Let us now consider the hermetic teachings regarding mental gender. The hermetic teachers impart their instruction regarding this subject by bidding their students examine the report of their consciousness regarding their self. The students are bidden to turn their attention inward upon the self dwelling within each. Each student is led to see that his consciousness gives him first a report of the existence of his self. The report is I am. This at first seems to be the final words from the consciousness, but a little further examination discloses the fact that this I am 
may be separated or split into two distinct parts or aspects, which, while working in unison and in conjunction, yet nevertheless may be separated in consciousness, while at first there seems to be only an I existing a more careful and closer examination reveals the fact that there exists an I and a me. These mental twins differ in their characteristics and nature, and an examination of their nature and the phenomena arising from the same will throw much light upon many of the problems of mental influence. Let us begin with a consideration of the me, which is usually mistaken for the I by the student, until he presses the inquiry a little further back into the recesses of consciousness. A man thinks of his self, in its aspect of me, as being composed of certain feelings, tastes, likes, dislikes, habits, peculiar ties, characteristics, etc., all of which go to make up his personality, or the self known to himself and others. He knows that these emotions and feelings change, are born, and die away, are subject to the principle of rhythm and the principle of polarity, which take him from one extreme of feeling to another. He also thinks of the me as being certain knowledge gathered together in his mind, and thus forming a part of himself. This is the me of a man. But we have proceeded too hastily. The me of many men may be said to consist largely of their consciousness of the body and their physical appetites, etc., their consciousness being largely bound up with their bodily nature. They practically live there. Some men even go so far as to regard their personal apparel as part of their me and actually seem to consider it a part of themselves. A writer has humorously said that men consist of three parts, soul, body, and clothes. These clothes conscious people would lose their personality if divested of their clothing by savages upon the occasion of a shipwreck. But even many who are not so closely bound up with the idea of personal raiment stick closely to the consciousness of their bodies being their me. They cannot conceive of a self independent of the body. Their mind seems to be practically a something belonging to their body, which in many cases it is indeed. But as man rises in the scale of consciousness, he is able to disentangle his me from his idea of body and is able to think of his body as belonging to the mental part of him. But even then, he is freely apt to identify the me entirely with the mental states, feelings, etc., which he feels to exist within him. He is very apt to consider these internal states as identical with himself instead of their being simply things produced by some part of his mentality and existing within him, of him, and in him, but still not himself. He sees that he may change these internal states of feelings by an effort of will and that he may produce a feeling or state of an exactly opposite nature in the same way and yet the same me exists. And so, after a while, he is able to set aside these various mental states, emotions, feelings, habits, qualities, characteristics, and other personal mental belongings. He is able to set them aside in the not-me collection of curiosities and encumbrances, as well as valuable possessions. This requires much mental concentration and power of mental analysis on the part of the student. But still, the task is possible for the advanced student, and even those not so far advanced are able to see in the imagination how the process may be performed. After this laying aside process has been performed, the student will find himself in conscious possession of a self, which may be considered its I and me dual aspects. The me will be felt to be a something mental in which thoughts, ideas, emotions, feelings, and other mental states may be produced and may be considered as the mental womb, 
as the ancients styled it, capable of generating mental offspring. It reports to the consciousness as a me with latent powers of creation and generation of mental progeny of all sorts and kinds. Its powers of creative energy are felt to be enormous, but still it seems to be conscious that it must receive some form of energy from either its eye companion or else from some other eye, ere it is able to bring into being its mental creations. This consciousness brings with a realization of an enormous capacity for mental work and creative ability. But the student soon finds that this is not all that he finds within his inner consciousness. He finds that there exists a mental something which is able to will the me act along certain creative lines and which is also able to stand aside and witness the mental creation. This part of himself he is taught to call his I. He is able to rest in its consciousness at will. He finds there is not a consciousness of an ability to generate and actively create in the sense of the gradual process attendant upon mental operations, but rather a sense and consciousness of an ability to project an energy from the I to the me, a process of willing that the mental creation begin and proceed. He also finds that the I is able to stand aside and witness the operations of the me's mental creation and generation. There is this dual aspect in the mind of every person. The I represents the masculine principle of mental gender. The me represents the female principle. The I represents the aspect of being. The me, the aspect of becoming. You will notice that the principle of correspondence operates on this plane just as it does upon the great plane upon which the creation of the universes is performed. The two are similar in kind, although vastly different in degree. As above, so below. As below, so above. These aspects of mind, the masculine and feminine principles, the I and the me, considered in the connection with the well-known mental and psychic phenomena give the master key to these dimly known regions of mental operation and manifestation. The principle of mental gender gives the truth underlying the whole field of the phenomena of mental influence, etc. The tendency of the feminine principle is always in the direction of receiving impressions, while the tendency of the masculine principle is always in the direction of giving out or expressing. The feminine principle has a much more varied field of operation than has the masculine principle. The feminine principle conducts the work of generating new thoughts, concepts, ideas, including the work of the imagination. The masculine principle contents itself with the work of the will in its varied phases. And yet without the active aid of the will of the masculine principle, the feminine principle is apt to rest content with generating mental images which are the result of impressions received from outside instead of producing original mental creations. Persons who can give continued attention and thought to a subject actively employ both of the mental principles, the feminine in the work of active mental generation and the masculine will in stimulating and energizing the creative portion of the mind the majority of persons really employ the masculine principle but little and are content to live according to the thoughts and ideas instilled into the me from the eye of other minds. But it is not our purpose to dwell upon this phase of the subject, which may be studied from any good textbook upon psychology with the key that we have given you regarding mental gender. The student of psychic phenomena is aware of the wonderful phenomena classified under the head of telepathy, thought transference, mental influence, suggestion, hypnotism, etc. Many have sought for an explanation of these varied phases of phenomena under the theories of the various dual mind teachers, and in a measure they are right, for there is clearly a manifestation of two distinct phases of mental activity 
But if such students will consider these dual minds in the light of the hermetic teachings regarding vibration and mental gender, they will see that the long sought for key is at hand. In the phenomena of telepathy, it is seen how the vibratory energy of the masculine principle is projected toward the feminine principle of another person, and the latter takes the seed thought and allows it to develop into maturity. In the same way suggestion and hypnotism operates, the masculine principle of the person giving the suggestion directs a stream of vibratory energy or willpower toward the feminine principle of the other person, and the latter, accepting it, makes it its own and acts and thinks accordingly. An idea thus lodged in the mind of another person grows and develops, and in time is regarded as the rightful mental offspring of the individual, whereas it is in reality like the cuckoo egg placed in the sparrow's nest, where it destroys the rightful offspring and makes itself a home. The normal method is for the masculine and feminine principles in a person's mind to coordinate and act harmoniously in conjunction with each other. But, unfortunately, the masculine principle in the average person is too lazy to act. The display of willpower is too slight, and the consequence is that such persons are ruled almost entirely by the minds and wills of other persons, whom they allow to do their thinking and willing for them. How few original thoughts or original actions are performed by the average person? Are not the majority of persons merely shadows and echoes of others, having stronger wills or minds than themselves? The trouble is that the average person dwells almost altogether in his me consciousness and does not realize that he has such a thing as an I. He is polarized in his feminine principle of mind and the masculine principle in which is lodged the will is allowed to remain inactive and not employed. The strong men and women of the world invariably manifest the masculine principle of will and their strength depends materially upon this fact. Instead of living upon the impressions made upon their minds by others, they dominate their own minds by their will, obtaining the kind of mental images desired, and moreover, dominate the minds of others likewise in the same manner. Look at the strong people, how they manage to implant their seed thoughts in the minds of the masses of the people, thus causing the latter to think thoughts in accordance with the desires and wills of the strong individuals. This is why the masses of people are such sheep-like creatures, never originating an idea of their own, nor using their own powers of mental activity. The manifestation of mental gender may be noticed all around us in everyday life. The magnetic persons are those who are able to use the masculine principle in the way of impressing their ideas upon others. The actor who makes people weep or cry as he wills is employing this principle, and so is the successful orator, statesman, preacher, writer, or other people who are before the public attention. The peculiar influence exerted by some people over others is due to the manifestation of mental gender along the vibrational lines above indicated. In this principle lies the secret of personal magnetism personal influence, fascination, etc., as well as the phenomena generally grouped under the name of hypnotism. The student who has familiarized himself with the phenomena generally spoken of as psychic will have discovered the important part played in the said phenomena by the force which science has styled suggestion, by which term is meant the process or method whereby an idea is transferred to or impressed upon the mind of another, causing the second mind to act in accordance therewith. A correct understanding of suggestion is necessary in order to intelligently comprehend the varied psychical phenomena which suggestion underlies, but still more is a knowledge of vibration and mental gender necessary for the student of suggestion, for the whole principle of suggestion depends 
upon the principle of mental gender and vibration. It is customary for the writers and teachers of suggestion to explain that it is the objective or voluntary mind which make the mental impression or suggestion upon the subjective or involuntary mind, but they do not describe the process or give us any analogy in nature whereby we may more readily comprehend the idea. But if you will think of the matter in the light of the hermetic teachings, you will be able to see that the energizing of the feminine principle by the vibratory energy of the masculine principle is in accordance to the universal laws of nature and that the natural world affords countless analogies whereby the principle may be understood. In fact, the hermetic teachings show that the very creation of the universe follows the same law and that in all creative manifestations upon the planes of the spiritual, the mental, and the physical, there is always in operation this principle of gender, this manifestation of the masculine and the feminine principles. As above, so below. As below, so above. And more than this, when the principle of mental gender is once grasped and understood, the varied phenomena of psychology at once becomes capable of intelligent classification and study, instead of being very much in the dark. The principle works out in practice because it is based upon the immutable universal laws of life. We shall not enter into an extended discussion of or description of the varied phenomena of mental influence or psychic activity. There are many books, many of them quite good, which have been written and published on this subject of late years. The main facts stated in these very books are correct, although the several writers have attempted to explain the phenomena by various pet theories of their own. The student may acquaint himself with these matters, and by using the theory of mental gender, he will be able to bring order out of the chaos of conflicting theory and teachings, and may, moreover, readily make himself a master of the subject if he be so inclined. The purpose of this work is not to give an extended account of psychic phenomena, but rather to give to the student a master key, whereby he may unlock the many doors leading into the parts of the temple of knowledge which he may wish to explore. We feel that in this consideration of the teachings of the Kybalion, one may find an explanation which will serve to clear away many perplexing difficulties, a key that will unlock many doors. What is the use of going into detail regarding all of the many features of psychic phenomena and mental science, provided we place in the hands of the student the means whereby he may acquaint himself fully regarding any phase of the subject which may interest him? With the aid of the Kybalion, one may go through any occult library anew, the old light from Egypt illuminating many dark pages and obscure subjects. That is the purpose of this book. We do not come expounding a new philosophy, but rather furnishing the outlines of a great world, old teaching which will make clear the teachings of others, which will serve as a great reconciler of differing theories and opposing doctrines. The Kybalion, Chapter 15 Hermetic Axioms The possession of knowledge, unless accompanied by a manifestation and expression in action, is like the hoarding of precious metals, a vain and foolish thing. Knowledge, like wealth, is intended for use. The law of use is universal, and he who violates it suffers by reason of his conflict with natural forces. The hermetic teachings, while always having been kept securely locked up in the minds of the fortunate possessors thereof, for reasons which we have already stated, were never intended to be merely stored away and secreted. The law of use is dwelt upon in the teachings, as you may see by reference to the above quotation from the Kybalion, which states it forcibly, knowledge without use and expression is a vain thing, bringing no good to its possessor or to the race. Beware of mental miserliness and express it into action, 
that which you have learned. Study the axioms and aphorisms, but practice them also. We give below some of the more important hermetic axioms from the Kybalion, with a few comments added to each. Make these your own, and practice and use them, for they are not really your own until you have used them. To change your mood or mental state, change your vibration. One may change his mental vibrations by an effort of will in the direction of deliberately fixing the attention upon a more desirable state. Will directs the attention, and attention changes the vibration. Cultivate the art of attention by means of the will, and you have solved the secret of the mastery of moods and mental states. To destroy an undesirable rate of mental vibration, put into operation the principle of polarity and concentrate upon the opposite pole to that which you desire to suppress. Kill out the undesirable by changing its polarity. This is one of the most important of the hermetic formulas. It is based upon true scientific principles. We have shown you that a mental state and its opposite were merely the two poles of one thing, and that by mental transmutation, the polarity might be reversed. This principle is known to modern psychologists who apply it to the breaking up of undesirable habits by bidding their students concentrate upon the opposite quality. If you are possessed of fear, do not waste time trying to kill out fear, but instead cultivate the quality of courage and the fear will disappear. Some writers have expressed this idea most forcibly by using the illustration of the dark room. You do not have to shovel out or sweep out the darkness, but merely opening the shutters and letting in the light, the darkness has disappeared. To kill out a negative quality, concentrate upon the positive pole of that same quality, and the vibrations will gradually change from negative to positive until finally you will become polarized on the positive pole instead of the negative. The reverse is also true, as many have found out to their sorrow when they have allowed themselves to vibrate too constantly on the negative pole of things. By changing your polarity, you may master your moods, change your mental states, remake your disposition, and build up character. Much of the mental mastery of the advanced hermetics is due to this application of polarity, which is one of the important aspects of mental transmutation. Remember the hermetic axiom quoted previously, which says, Mind, as well as metals and elements, may be transmuted from state to state, degree to degree, condition to condition, pole to pole, vibration to vibration. The mastery of polarization is the mastery of the fundamental principles of mental transmutation or mental alchemy. For unless one acquires the art of changing his own polarity, he will be unable to affect his environment. An understanding of this principle will enable one to change his own polarity as well as that of others. If he will but devote the time, care, study, and practice necessary to master the art. The principle is true, but the results obtained depend upon the persistent patience and practice of the student. Rhythm may be neutralized by an application of the art of polarization. As we have explained in previous chapters, the Hermetists hold that the principle of rhythm manifests on the mental plane as well as on the physical plane, and that the bewildering succession of moods, feelings, emotions, and other mental states are due to the backward and forward swing of the mental pendulum, which carries us from one extreme of feeling to the other. The Hermetists also teach that the law of neutralization enables one, to a great extent, to overcome the operation of rhythm in consciousness. As we have explained, there is a higher plane of consciousness as well as the ordinary lower plane, and the master by rising mentally to the higher plane, 
causes the swing of the mental pendulum to manifest on the lower plane, and he, dwelling on his higher plane, escapes the consciousness of the swing backward. This is affected by polarizing on the higher self and thus raising the mental vibrations of the ego above those of the ordinary plane of consciousness. It is akin to rising above a thing and allowing it to pass beneath you. The advanced hermetist polarizes himself at the positive pole of his being, the I am pole rather than the pole of personality, and by refusing and denying the operation of rhythm, raises himself above its plane of consciousness, and standing firm in his statement of being, he allows the pendulum to swing back on the lower plane without changing his polarity. This is accomplished by all individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery, whether they understand the law or not. Such persons simply refuse to allow themselves to be swung back by the pendulum of mood and emotion, and by steadfastly affirming the superiority, they remain polarized on the positive pole. The master, of course, attains a far greater degree of proficiency because he understands the law which he is overcoming by a higher law, and by the use of his will, he attains a degree of poise and mental steadfastness almost impossible of belief on the part of those who allow themselves to be swung backward and forward by the mental pendulum of moods and feelings. Remember always, however, that you do not really destroy the principle of rhythm, for that is indestructible. You simply overcome one law by counterbalancing it with another, and thus maintaining an equilibrium. The laws of balance and counterbalance are in operation on the mental as well as on the physical planes, and an understanding of these laws enables one to seem to overthrow laws, whereas he is merely exerting a counterbalance. Nothing escapes the principle of cause and effect, but there are many planes of causation, and one may use the laws of the higher to overcome the laws of the lower. By an understanding of the practice of polarization, the hermetists rise to a higher plane of causation and thus counterbalance the laws of the lower planes of causation. By rising above the plane of ordinary causes, they become themselves, in a degree, causes instead of being merely caused. By being able to master their own moods and feelings, and by being able to neutralize rhythm, as we have already explained, they are able to escape a great part of the operations of cause and effect on the ordinary plane. The masses of people are carried along, obedient to their environment, the wills and desires of others stronger than themselves, the effects of inherited tendencies, the suggestions of those about them, and other outward causes which tend to move them about on the chessboard of life like mere pawns. By rising above these influencing causes, the advanced hermetists seek a higher plane of mental action, and by dominating their moods, emotions, impulses, and feelings, they create for themselves new characters, qualities, and powers by which they overcome their ordinary environment, and thus become practically players instead of mere pawns. Such people help to play the game of life understandingly, instead of being moved about this way and that way by stronger influences and powers and wills. They use the principle of cause and effect instead of being used by it. Of course, even the highest are subject to the principle as it manifests on the higher planes, but on the lower planes of activity, they are masters instead of slaves. As the Kybalion says, the wise ones serve on the higher but rule on the lower. They obey the laws coming from above them, but on their own plane, and those below them, they rule and give orders, and yet, in so doing, they form a part of the principle, instead of opposing it. The wise man falls in with the law, and by understanding its movements, he operates it, 
instead of being its blind slave, just as does the skilled swimmer turn this way and that way, going and coming as he will, instead of being as the log which is carried here and there, so is the wise man as compared to the ordinary man, and yet both swimmer and log, wise man and fool, are subject to law. He who understands this is well on the road to mastery. In conclusion, let us again call your attention to the hermetic axiom. True hermetic transmutation is a mental art. In the above axiom, the hermetists teach that the great work of influencing one's environment is accomplished by mental power, the universe being wholly mental. It follows that it may be ruled only by mentality, and in this truth to be found an explanation of all the phenomena and manifestations of the various mental powers which are attracting so much attention and study in these earlier years of the 20th century, back of and under the teachings of the various cults and schools remains ever constant the principle of the mental substance of the universe. If the universe be mental in its substantial nature, then it follows that mental transmutation must change the conditions and phenomena of the universe. If the universe is mental, then mind must be the highest power affecting its phenomena. If this be understood, then all the so-called miracles and wonder workings are seen plainly for what they are. The all is mind. The universe is mental. The Kybalion. The end.